terminar y en aras del tiempo, eh, vamos a seguir con la doctora Christine Hutton. La doctora Christine Hutton es una pediatra reumatóloga y como especialista en medicina del deporte y ejercicio. Digamos que su práctica clínica se centra en la evaluación y el manejo de lesiones y enfermedades musculoesqueléticas en niños activos y la promoción de la actividad física. Eh, como siempre la misma dinámica, una charla pregrabada y al final tenemos las, las preguntas para las doctoras para que por favor la, las vayan preparando. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about exercise, physical activity, and physical fitness in pediatric rheumatic diseases. My name is Kristen Houghton, and I'm a pediatric rheumatologist and sports medicine physician in Vancouver, Canada. I'm very passionate about exercise as medicine, and I'd like to begin with a provocative quote about the power of exercise. The quote is this, the single most important thing one can do to improve one's health is exercise. With that brief introduction, there are third, three learning objectives for today's talk. After the talk, I hope you'll be able to describe levels of physical activity and physical fitness in pediatric rheumatic diseases. You'll be able to describe the benefits of physical activity and exercise in pediatric rheumatic diseases. And you'll be able to describe some steps to promote physical activity in your patients with pediatric rheumatic diseases. There are many health benefits of physical activity, and these are well described. In children, physical activity has been shown to improve academic performance by improving concentration and attention. It improves mental health with lower risks of depression and anxiety. It improves muscular fitness, including muscle strength and endurance. It improves cardiovascular health and aerobic fitness. It also improves cardiometabolic health and normalizes blood sugar levels. It is also important for long-term health. It reduces the risk of more than 30 chronic illnesses, including type 2 diabetes, obesity, and several types of cancer. It improves bone strength and helps maintain a healthy weight and healthy body composition. So it's well known that children who are physically active are happier and healthier. But despite this knowledge, there is a global public health crisis of inactivity, and most children worldwide are not active enough for optimal growth and development. The World Health Organization Global Status Report on Physical Activity published last year showed that 81% of children do not meet the recommended physical activity guidelines of one hour of moderately vigorous physical activity per day. Children with chronic illness as a group have lower levels of physical activity than their healthy peers, and it follows that most children with pediatric rheumatic diseases do not meet the physical activity guidelines. Children with pediatric rheumatic diseases um, may stop physical activity and sport at diagnosis, predominantly because arthritis, myositis can affect their mobility and it can make it difficult for them to do their usual activities. The combination of active disease, joint pain, stiffness, fatigue, weakness, and treatment side effects, including abdominal pain, nausea, fatigue, can result in difficulties in normal function. This diagram from Nature Review's Rheumatology a few years ago shows the vicious cycle of inactivity and systemic dysfunction that can happen in a child with arthritis. You see a child holding their knee, they have knee arthritis, This leads to a, a brief period of physical inactivity, one hopes, but if there's any ignorance or overprotection by parents or teachers or coaches or healthcare providers, the child can become isolated, fearful of activity. This can lead to deconditioning, metabolic disturbances, worsening of symptoms, worsening of pain and quality of life, and it can be a very difficult cycle to get out of. We know that children with pediatric rheumatic diseases are less active than their peers, They spend more time going to healthcare appointments, and it can be difficult for them to join in regular physical activity or sport. Studies in children with juvenile arthritis show that they spend less time engaged in moderately vigorous physical activity, more time resting and sleeping. They have lower participation in sports and lower participation in social and physical leisure activities. Physical activity is directly related to physical fitness. And lower levels of physical activity in pediatric rheumatic diseases has been shown to be related to lower levels of aerobic or cardiovascular fitness, lower anaerobic fitness, lower muscle strength and endurance, lower bone mass and lower bone strength, 
as well as worse outcome measures on patient reported outcome measures, including fatigue and pain. So I'd like to spend a few minutes on the parameters of physical fitness. Aerobic fitness is lower in children with rheumatic diseases. Aerobic or with oxygen exercise provides cardiovascular conditioning. Examples include brisk walking, running, biking, swimming. It's very important because higher levels of aerobic fitness are associated with lower all-cause mortality. There are many reasons that there may be impairments in aerobic fitness in children with rheumatic diseases. In part, this relates to low physical activity levels and deconditioning, but there's also treatment and disease-related pathophysiology. Muscle atrophy, muscle weakness, anemia of chronic disease, and cardiorespiratory diseases can all play a role. In children with juvenile arthritis, low levels of fitness are not clearly related to disease activity, with lower levels reported in children with active disease and those with prolonged remission. In the few studies of aerobic fitness in children with juvenile dermatomyositis, there's an inverse correlation with disease activity. So children with more active disease have lower levels of aerobic fitness. Now, anaerobic fitness is also lower in children with rheumatic diseases. Anaerobic exercise is any activity that breaks down glucose for energy without using oxygen. Generally, anaerobic activities are short bursts of high-intensity activity, such as sprinting or jumping. Importantly, many play activities and activities of daily living are anaerobic in nature. Deficits in anaerobic fitness relate, again, to physical activity levels and deconditioning, also to muscle fitness and to the inflammatory state with circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines linked to impairments in anaerobic fitness. Any degree of malnutrition or neuromuscular diseases may also play a role. There are positive correlations with function as measured by the CHAC and patient-reported outcome measures of fatigue, pain, and global well-being. And importantly, both aerobic and anaerobic fitness can improve with exercise intervention. Muscular fitness includes muscle force, power, and endurance. And again, this is also lower in children with rheumatic diseases. Muscle strength is a local characteristic of each muscle or muscle groups, and children may have regional areas of weakness. So for example, in children with arthritis, we see greater, greater weakness in the muscles surrounding swollen joints. In children with dermatomyositis, there is more proximal muscle weakness than distal muscle weakness. Overall, though, there is a generalized weakness in children with rheumatic diseases reflected by lower grip strength. There may be muscle atrophy. There may be poor neuromuscular control and poor balance if there's lower extremity involvement. And there are positive correlations with muscle strength and function. So studies in children with juvenile arthritis have shown that grip strength is related to the CHAC, functional outcome measure. Moving on to bone health, so childhood is a critical time for promoting bone health. And again, children with pediatric rheumatic disease have lower bone strength than healthy children. There's a higher risk of osteoporosis or low bone mineral density as measured by DEXA. In children with juvenile arthritis, they're one and a half to three times more likely to have a long bone fracture. And compression fractures are more common in children with systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases like dermatomyositis or lupus, especially if there's prolonged corticosteroid exposure. Longitudinal studies using peripheral quantitative CT to measure both bone mass and bone quality show that these bone deficits represent a mixed defect of bone accrual and lower muscle forces. There are many reasons for bone health impairments in children, and the prime ones seem to be a lack of weight-bearing physical activity, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. But there's also relationships with disease severity, disease duration, growth, especially if children have disease during the adolescent growth period, use of corticosteroids, especially high dose and prolonged doses, vitamin D and calcium intake, and of course, physical activity levels, as I mentioned. And again, importantly, both muscular fitness and bone health can improve with exercise intervention. There are several studies on physical activity and exercise intervention in juvenile arthritis, and a few studies in juvenile dermatomyositis and juvenile fibromyalgia. There's only one 
um, targeted exercise intervention trial in lupus. Overall, studies suggest exercise therapy may improve function, may improve quality of life, and fitness. Most of the trials to improve physical fitness or increase physical activity levels show a very small effect size, largely because of pro program, poor program adherence. So studies in juvenile arthritis show improved joint range of motion, lower active joint count, better function as measured by the CHAC, lower pain levels, higher quality of life, and higher physical activity levels and physical fitness parameters. In dermatomyositis, studies have shown improved strength, less pain and fatigue, improved quality of life, and again, higher physical activity levels and higher physical fitness parameters. In fibromyalgia, most of the studies have looked at patient reported outcome measures of pain, depression, and quality of life with positive outcomes and also improved fitness. In lupus, there's improved fitness as well as autonomic function as measured by the heart rate variability. Importantly, exercise does not worsen disease activity. So exercise is medicine. Children who are physically active are happier and healthier. And exercise may improve symptoms and health-related outcomes in children with pediatric rheumatic diseases. However, most healthcare providers don't provide physical activity counseling or exercise prescription. Before providing physical activity counseling, it's important to assess physical activity levels. In the clinic setting, the exercise or physical activity vital sign is recommended. This includes asking patients a couple of questions. The first is, on average, how many days per week do you engage in moderate to strenuous physical activity like running and playing? The second is, on average, how many minutes do you engage in exercise at this level? You multiply days times minutes and you have your physical activity or exercise vital sign. It only takes one to two minutes to complete, and it provides easily trackable information. And while it's recognized that the accuracy of self-reported exercise is low, it's still important to ask patients. They may over-report their physical activity because of social desirability bias, but just the very aspect of asking about it at every clinic visit signals that it's important for their health. It's also important to assess their motivation for physical activity, their existing physical activity habits, their preferences, and any barriers to being more active. Some questions that you can ask in the clinic include, how much time does the child and the family spend on physical activity? What about sedentary activities and screen time? Has the child's physical activity level changed recently? Are there activities the child can no longer do because of their symptoms, because of joint pain or fatigue? or medication side effects? What activities does the child enjoy? What would they like to get back to? And what does the family see as barriers to doing more physical activity? It's important to have some strategies to help families with the barriers to increasing activity. One of the biggest barriers is lack of time. And a good way to increase activity is to make it habitual. So build it into every day. Suggest active transportation if they live in neighborhoods that are safe to walk or bike. Modify their gym class in school. If they're not able to fully participate, can they do their physiotherapy exercises at that time? Encourage active games with friends. Not all children like sport, and if they don't like sport or don't have those skills, suggest non-competitive or non-organized activities. They could dance, they can swim, they can bike, they can walk. They have a pet, that's extra motivation to get out walking. Again, increasing active hobbies and transportation as much as possible. If they have pain and fatigue, it's important to start slow and rest at modifying the activities as they need to. If they have stiffness, it's important to start slow, making sure that they adequately warm up their muscles and joints, and planning for activity later in the day may be more successful. If they're deconditioned because of their um, recent illness or disease flare, again, starting slow, so-called exercise or activity snacks, five to 10 minutes, and build those up over the day. There are many psychological factors to address. They may be fearful of starting activity and concerned that it may cause pain or disease flare. And it may be beneficial to start activity in a, what they perceive as a safe environment with a physiotherapist or trusted adult. It's important to explore attitudes about exercise and motivational interviewing can be quite helpful. You can ask your patients on a scale of zero to 10, 
How ready are you to increase your physical activity? If their response is a three, you can ask them why three instead of a two? What do you think the benefits of physical activity will be? It's also important for them to choose activities they enjoy. There may be social concerns, isolation, overprotection. And in these settings, you can exercise within a group or you, it may be necessary to educate their coaches or teachers. And families may benefit from joining advocacy groups for support. So physical activity prescription is the next step after physical activity counseling. And again, it's important to note exercise and physical activity really are ideal drugs. They're safe, they're inexpensive, widely available, and the dose can be individualized. Now, as pediatricians, we routinely prescribe medications in the correct dosage, the correct route. We know the frequency, the duration for a number of different childhood conditions. We understand the mechanism of action, the expected benefits, and the potential side effects. But surprisingly, few are trained to prescribe physical activity and exercise, equally powerful medicines, and essential components of health, growth, and development with the same precision and understanding of outcomes. Fortunately, it's quite straightforward. You can start by writing a physical activity or exercise prescription. Right, the very act of writing the prescription shows families that it's therapeutic, and studies suggest that a written prescription results in higher physical activity levels, higher physical fitness levels, and better quality of life. The principle used for exercise dosing is called the FIT principle, where F stands for frequency, I stands for intensity, T for type, and the other T for time. This is an example of a physical activity prescription pad. It has the indication for activity, the type of activity, the frequency in days per week, the duration in minutes, and then you can check off intensity as light, moderate, or intense. I think it's really important to encourage age-appropriate play and sport. Play and sport are important for children's growth and development, and both their physical and mental health. And as much as possible, I encourage them to join in with their peers. For younger children, encouraging activities to promote physical literacy, the so-called ABCs of activity, agility, balance, coordination, is important. If children are physically inactive, it's important to begin with lower intensity physical activity. And if they have active disease, you may need to begin with therapeutic exercise before encouraging age appropriate play and sport. In Canada, there's a relatively new initiative called PARCS, where PA stands for physical activity, RX is shorthand for prescription, and it also stands for PARCS as it is uh, supported by our National Parks Board. And it's essentially a prescription for nature. Recommendation is a minimum of two hours per week and at least 20 minutes at a time. And this is because a growing body of research suggests that spending time in nature has positive effects on physical and mental health over and above the benefits of exercise. So exercising is excellent. Exercising outside in nature is even better. And this is what one of the prescription pads looks like. So it's got a nice little nature scene um, in the form of a pill. And then it says the side effects may include living longer, increased energy, decreased anxiety, better mood, pain reduction, reduced stress levels, and improved heart health. For physicians, although we know there are many benefits to exercise and physical activity prescription, there are still barriers to implementing this in practice. One of the main barriers is lack of time. And I'd like to just emphasize how little time it takes to do physical activity counseling. In terms of taking the physical activity or exercise vital sign, it takes about a minute. Exercise and physical activity prescription is two to five minutes. Counseling, of course, takes longer, but this is something that can be done over multiple visits or perhaps can be done by other allied healthcare professionals in your practice. Often we feel like the problem is too big. How are we going to fix this problem of inactivity? But I think it's important to note that as healthcare providers, we can make a big difference. We can educate families and patients on the benefits of physical activity for their physical and mental health. We can also model physical activity behaviors and encourage parents to be more active and model positive physical activity behaviors. Of course, as healthcare providers, we're always concerned about not causing harm. 
But it's important to remember that exercise does not cause disease flares for children with rheumatic diseases. And there's really very few contraindications to exercise. Most children can start with low intensity exercise. If there's a lack of confidence, knowledge, or resources, there are several um, education and self-reflection practices through the Exercises Medicine website. You can just practice on your patients and feel you are better skilled at doing physical activity counseling. And of course, one can refer to resources depending on your um, availability in your area. There may be special programs or healthcare professionals like kinesiologists, physiotherapists who can help you. So in summary, the take-home points and action points are children with pediatric rheumatic disease are less physically active and less physically fit. Exercise does not cause disease flares and children with pediatric rheumatic disease can participate in most physical activity and sport. Physical activity and exercise may improve symptoms and health outcomes in children with pediatric rheumatic disease. And as healthcare providers, we play an important role in promoting physical activity. I encourage you to ask your patients and families about physical activity at every visit, counsel on physical activity, write an exercise or physical activity prescription, and we can also lead by example and integrate physical activity into our daily lives. This is a slide that has a few of the key references.